Our second scripture reading this morning is from Colossians 1, 1 through 14. This is a letter of Paul to the Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, so among yourselves from the day you heard and understood the grace of God in truth, as you learn from Ephorus, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding to lead a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. May God add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word today. For those of you who were not here last week, I preach barefoot to remind myself that I am standing on holy ground. Um, and it has been a very holy week, this first week with you all. You are fantastic. Do you know that about yourselves? You're wonderful. Um, the amount of welcome that I have received, handwritten cards from people who weren't here last week offering me welcome because they couldn't do so in person on Sunday. And like I shared earlier, the Cofields going to visit them for a pacemaker maker surgery. It's a pretty, pretty major surgery. Um, and then finding more concern for me and how I'm managing a first week. Um, the flowers, um, the breads um, are amazing and delicious. Strawberry and banana bread and banana bread with chocolate chips. Um, I love you all again. <laughs> it, it has been very special. So thank you so much. Um, I think that you should know that when I sat down with our district superintendent and heard of this appointment, um, she said, and, and this doesn't go outside our room because we're allowed to brag with family, um, but for us to know um, that you are one of her favorite congregations to visit and loves coming to worship with you um, and finds you to be in what she used her phrase, a cutting edge congregation. Um, and so thank you um, for who you are and for the welcome that you have given me um, and with all the intentionally, intentionality and thoughtfulness that I have already found, I completely understand now where our district superintendent is coming from and I'm very honored um, to be here and to be a part of that. This has been a very hard week as well as a wonderful first week. We have the fatal shootings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castillo. And we also have the fatal shootings of Brent Thompson, of Patrick Zamaripa, of Michael Kroll, of Lauren Ahrens, and of Michael Smith. These are weeks where it's hard to find hope. These are weeks that are full of grief 
as we wonder how we will be able to move forward as a country. I shared with you last week um, of where I was afraid of my call um, during my study abroad in Ecuador. The specific instance of that fear was when I was attending an evangelical church there and the pastor gave a sermon on all of the economic troubles that Ecuador was facing because its president was Catholic and was not following Jesus Christ. Now, last I checked, um, Catholics do follow Christ and are a part of the Christian family, which was one of the things that divide between Catholics and Protestants and Ecuador that I found most jarring and most troublesome in my year there. And then to hear that divide legitimized and reinforced from the pulpit scared me. And so I scheduled a time to talk with the pastor about it. And we talked. And I don't know if I was just the gringa he was waving away or he really honestly didn't see how one related to another. Um, and I probably never will know what happened. But what I do know is that was the first moment where I was scared of my call, where I was scared that I would use the power that I have been given in this position to create and do the very harm that I'm trying to not do without even realizing it. That fear is something um, that is still with me, um, I think in a healthy way and is part of my barefoot and grounding um, because I come with my own enculturation and my own limitations and my own biases. I didn't have language for this fear until I pastored Wesley. There, um, we were in the multi-site setup, um, and Wesley is a church that is 48% African and African-American, 47% um, white, and then 5% Asian, Hispanic, and mixed. Um, and we were in um, ministry with another um, with Metropolitan that is largely a middle and upper class white congregation. And it was our SPRC chair that brought in an organization to help us do some bias trainings together. And that what has given me the vocabulary for this fear. Because there is such a thing as implicit bias that works in our lives. Um, and it is something that operates at the subconscious level. It is something that is created and that is reinforced and that is transmitted um, by our priming. It's something that we're not even aware of. And it's triggered automatically. It's that rapid association of people and groups and characteristics and stereotypes. And it, here's the scary thing, right? It runs contrary to our stated beliefs. So we can say that we believe in equity and fully mean that and fully believe that and dedicate ourselves to that and still behave in ways that are discriminatory and biased. And it happens at the individual level and it happens at the institutional level. Um, we have a little bit of the knowledge uh, background of how this happens from Timothy Wilson at the University of Virginia. He's written a book, Strangers to Ourselves. Um, and did you know that the brain processes 11 million bits of information per second and that we are conscious of about 40? That's the subconscious mind at work. That's where our implicit bias comes in. As much as we are working in our lives and as much as we are called in our Methodist good old John Wesley three general rules to do no harm, to do all the good we can and to stay in love with God, this is something that I want all of us to be aware of so that we can fully do what we want to do and not doing harm and in doing good. When we turn to this letter um, to Colossians, um, this letter was written because the author had found out about a false teaching that was going on in the community. Now, we don't know what that false teaching was. There are snippets and phrases throughout the letter that would have been known back then, but are, don't give us enough today to piece together what was going on. 
But what we do know is that the author addressed this false teaching through relationship. Through the connection that they had built together, through calling on that, and then asking people to center themselves and to remember what the gospel had accomplished, the bearing fruit that had happened because of the gospel, because of their connection, because of the work of Christ in them. And this letter, this letter speaks of the salvation that we all have in Jesus Christ, of the liberation that we all have in the redempting work that God has done in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit for all of us. Let me read that last verse. The Father has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints of the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I don't know about you, but I want my country rescued from darkness this week. I want broken taillights to come with orders for repair or tickets, not fatherless families. And I want the police officers who are there protecting the protesters who are protesting them to go home to their families at night. And not just that, but to know that we respect and honor that level of commitment. And more than that, I want a way for us to want both those things without a polarized society saying that meaning wanting one means being against the other. I want a way for us to be able to address systemic racism when it rears its ugly head, whether that be in the police force or anywhere else in our lives, church included. And I also want us to be able to honor and to celebrate the belief of justice and equity that most of us do hold. And I want to be able to lift both of those truths together. I know it's hard. It's, I know it's so much easier to have the good guys and the bad guys very clearly delineated and separated, but that's not the way that life works. And we only escalate the violence if that's what we try to do. Here's what I know. I know that people are terrified right now. I know that there is anger and that there is pain and that there is grief. And I know that it has accumulated. And I know that there are enough experiences of broken trust on every side of this that none of us are innocent in this mess. But here's what I also know. I know that we serve a savior who came and who came up against such dominion of darkness and worse. And I know that we serve a Savior who being made in the very likeness of God did not consider likeness of God as something to be exploited. Someone who is able to not abuse the power that he had, but instead gave it up and emptied himself taking on the form of a servant, taking on human likeness, humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And I'm going to say even death on a lynching tree, even death by a sniper's bullet. We serve a savior who broke the cycle of violence. Do we dare follow that Savior? At worth, I know that we have just barely met each other. And I know how hard and how volatile these conversations are. And I know how high the stakes are. And I know that we come from a very wide spectrum of how we understand and how we interpret these events. And I'm glad for that. 
I am glad that we have that diversity because that is the gift that enables deep to call to deep. That enables us to think about this from an angle that we in our own enculturations and perspectives and world experience would not be able to see the whole picture otherwise. We need each other. And we need a savior who has done this work, who has committed all of who he is to this work, to lead us and to guide us. I am so honored to be the pastor of a congregation that values diversity because it's no longer a nice to have in our world. It's a must have because it is through the value of diversity that Christ can work through us and the brokenness of our systems so that in the church, simply being the church, we can bear fruit that will keep our community alive. Because in the church, in a multi-ethnic, diverse church, being the church, caring for each other, helping each other find jobs, helping each other find homes, filling in the gaps when life derails, that means resources are being shared across race lines that are not being shared in the wider structures of our society. And... It means that relationships are built and life and people are understood in ways that do not happen as we are currently structured. This is the chance for implicit biases to be broken down and reprogrammed, sometimes without our even being aware that that is happening. But if we are the church, if we are the church, that follows Jesus Christ, that cares for one another, and that gives power to empower all, then we are a community that can bear fruit that will keep our community alive. This is how I understand the call of the church. This is why I asked and was very adamant in my appointment form that I be appointed to a diverse church. I want for us to have the courage to follow Christ and to be the hope that our cities and that our country desperately needs. And I know at worth from just a week with you that you have the care and the thoughtfulness and the intentionality to accomplish such a thing. I typically end my sermons um, with a call to commitment, with a practice of discipleship that we can all focus on in the coming week. Um, and I would ask that you consider this following commitment to Make time in this coming week to have a conversation, whether that be over lunch or a walk or coffee with someone of a different ethnicity than your own. And that you ask them what fears that you, they have encountered in their lives and share what fears you have encountered with yours and how you have overcome those and how you have dealt with those. That we might begin to build the relational tissue together that will bring liberation, that will bring salvation, that will bring life for all of us.